Well, I'm still coming down off the clouds after that song. I think Brother Isaac Watts would appreciate a Brother Isaac playing that song so beautifully for us today. I appreciate this hymnal, too. My next viewpoint coming out in our uh, September Knowles letter is called, O oh, Songs That Will Not Let Me Go. And uh, I think the church has let them go, but I'm not about to surrender those songs to lesser things. And so if you want to read a good uh, article, I think Gibbon's even going to reprint it in, in his paper later on. But anyhow, I, I do appreciate this very much. Uh, Joe Garman brought some copies of The Lookout that has an article in there written by his daughter Stephanie on the Rafa House over in Cambodia, a wonderful work that God is blessing. And he put a stack of those on my little table out there next to our magazine, One Body. So be sure everybody takes one of those today and learns about the wonderful work of Rafa House. I think this is my fourth refreshing waters renewal to speak on, and I'm always renewed and go away refreshed when I come to one of these gatherings, and I know that that's the reason you're here too. And so uh, we've got a lot packed in this afternoon. So as Henry VIII said to his fifth wife, I'll not keep you long. <laughs> Would you take your Bibles and open them to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, verse 7. That's our text, and I am reading today from the New King James Version of Scripture, where Paul writes these words, Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. The glory of God, which is the theme of this Bible conference, is seen not only in our text, but also in the immediate context. The verse before our text says that we should with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sentence after our text ends with these words, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Now our text begins with this word, therefore, which begs the question, what is the therefore, therefore? Normally, the word therefore means something like, in view of what I have just said, or in this case, what I have just written. So how far back should we go back to do justice to this key word in the text, therefore? Someone has suggested that the overall theme of the book of Romans is righteousness, and he divided that theme into five parts. Righteousness needed, chapter 1, 18 through 320, righteousness imputed, chapter 321 through 521, righteousness imparted, chapter 6, 7, and 8, righteousness vindicated, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and then righteousness practiced, chapter 12 through chapter 15, verse 13. So you can see from that that the first 11 chapters of Romans are doctrinal in nature, basically the doctrine of righteousness. But beginning in chapter 12, we start to see the practical nature of righteousness. You see, doctrine, whatever doctrine it may be, is not just to be studied and pondered and discussed. We deceive ourselves when we engage in a study of revelation without ever proceeding to application. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So revelation, as good as it is, is not enough. There must be application as well. I believe we can safely say that the therefore in our text takes us back then to at least chapter 12, which seems to be the natural break in the book of Romans. The foundation of the doctrine of righteousness has been thoroughly laid. Now it is time to live out what we have taken in, to undertake what we have understood. So Paul begins by urging his readers in Rome to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to God. He says, this is the only reasonable thing to do. In fact, it is their reasonable service. But we are not to live only for God. That's the mistake the hermits made in church history. We also live for one another. No man is an island unto himself. For our fellowship is not only with the Father and the Son, but it's also with one another. 
Fellowship is first vertical and then horizontal. It is impossible to live only for God. We are more than our brother's keeper. We are our brother's brother or sister. And we have a duty, a sacred duty, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, for they too are children of God. So in the greater context, we discover at least 11 one another admonitions beginning in chapter 12, verse 5. We are members of one another. Chapter 12, verse 10, we are to be kindly affectionate to one another. Again, in verse 10 of chapter 12, we are to give preference to one another. Chapter 13, verse 8, we are to love one another. Chapter 14, verse 13, we are, this is the only negative here, we are not to judge one another anymore, he says, which means they were engaged in that practice, but we are not to judge one another anymore. Chapter 14, verse 19, we are to edify one another. Chapter 14, verse 5, we are to be like-minded to one another. Chapter 15, verse 7, our text, we are to receive one another. We'll exegete that in a moment. Chapter 15, verse 14, we are to admonish one another. And chapter 16, verse 16, we are to greet one another. And when I was in camp, that was our favorite verse because we studied the verse in its complete context with a holy kiss. And the girls reminding us it must be holy. So anyhow, we are to greet one another. Now focus our attention on the one another admonition in our text, receive one another. Therefore, receive one another. I see three eternal truths in this text. First of all, I see a command, receive one another, no getting around it. Second, an example, as Christ received us. Third, the purpose, to the glory of God. So let's take them one by one. First of all, a command, and not just a command, if a needed command or he wouldn't have said it. And so he writes to these people in Rome and says, receive one another. Now we understand what it means to receive something. We receive a phone call. We receive an email. We receive a card, a letter, gifts on our birthday or at Christmas. Newlyweds stand in the receiving line after their wedding. A receiver in the game of football receives a forward pass thrown to him. But in the spiritual realm, all of us go out to receive, to receive one another because we are receivers. We received with meekness the implanted word, which was able to save our souls. We received the gift of the Holy Spirit when we repented and were baptized. Everyone who gladly receives the word will be baptized. Those who manifest the searching spirit of the ancient Bereans will receive the word with all readiness. Through Christ we have received grace. In fact, we have received an abundance of grace. Through Christ we have received the atonement or the reconciliation. The motto of my alma mater is taken from scripture. Freely ye have received, guess what? Freely give. So we are all receivers. And I'm not taking time to give you these scriptures today, but this address in its entirety will be posted on our website later today. And uh, you can get the web address off any of our literature on our table. Since we have been received, we need to be a receiver. We need to be a receiving people. Receive is also translated accept or welcome. We need to be a receiving people, an accepting people, and a welcoming people, but let me quickly add a cautionary note at this point. The Bible clearly states we are not to receive everyone. John said, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, identified in the text as the doctrine of Christ, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Now, you need to understand, and most of you do, that there is a movement afoot today encouraging us as the church to be, quote, open and affirming. Those words sound wonderful, don't they? I want to be open-minded. I want to affirm people, don't you? Of course we do. But in Disciple World, December 2004, Judith Hock Ray 
who is a lesbian Disciples of Christ minister, wrote these words. More than 60 churches and ministers of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ have declared themselves, quote, open and affirming, committed to all persons, but especially lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered persons into their life and leadership. When I read that, at first, I was almost relieved to learn that only 60 congregations among the disciples of Christ have declared themselves to be open and affirming. But I have a question for them. How can we be open to that which is a closed book? That is, the teachings of Scripture. How can we affirm that which Scripture clearly denies? A Christian should always be cordial and kind, but this does not mean receiving, accepting, or welcoming, or affirming those who are living in clear violation of what we understand to be the inspired, revealed, and eternal Word of God. Now, having said that, let me say this. We are to receive all those whom Christ has received. That's the issue. We are to accept all those whom God has accepted. We are to welcome all those whom the Holy Spirit has welcomed into fellowship. Doesn't every Christian do this? Well, I am sorry to say that some of us do not receive some of us. And this is not a new thing. It's an age-old problem. The Apostle John commended the elder Gaius for his reception of the brethren, even those he was not personally familiar with. John wrote this, Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles, we ought to receive such, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. And this is what John practiced. And this is what Gaius practiced. And this Diotrephes most decidedly did not practice. For John wrote, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. And not content with that, he does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to putting them out of the church. Now, John called this practice evil. And he added, he who does evil has not seen God. Can we not see the face of God in our brother or sister? Jacob could. When he met his estranged brother Esau, he declared, I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. Do you see the face of God, even in an estranged brother or sister? And the Bible says they embraced and they were reconciled. They received one another in spite of a stormy past. Can we not, should we not do the same? Now this is the point Paul is making in Romans chapter 14. He starts out by saying, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Now, a thing in doubt is a thing in doubt. I mean, that sounds simplistic, but I have to say it. A thing in doubt will always be in doubt. Let us cease and desist from disputing over doubtful things and simply do what Paul admonished us to do, that is, receive, accept, welcome our brother. You see, there was a big food fight going on in Rome, which was the banqueting capital of the world, between the ministers of meat and the broccoli brothers. Now, the ministers of meat believed they could eat all things, but the broccoli brothers were vegetarian. And Paul had strong words for those sitting on both sides of the table, literally. To the ministers of meat, he said, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. You see, those who consider themselves strong have a tendency to be patronizing and to look down on their brothers. But to the broccoli brothers, he said, and let not him who does not eat, that is, who does not eat meat, judge him who eats. You see, those who are considered weak have a tendency to be judgmental and make disparaging remarks about their brothers. 
So at this point, Paul drops a bombshell in the middle of the table. And the food scatters everywhere. The vegetables, the meat, everything goes. He says, for God has received him. God has received the minister of meat. God has received the broccoli brother. And this really probably startled them. What? God has received him. God has received them. Yes, indeed. Because he goes on to say, if God has received him, who are you to judge him? If God has received him, who are you to reject him? This goes for folks on both sides of the table, on both sides of any matter today that can be considered doubtful. That's what Paul is saying. But he goes on to say, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? Now notice, he's calling both of them brothers. Okay, Both of them brothers. The prodigal son's older brother could not bring himself to call his brother, brother. He said to his father, this thy son, and the father said to him, no, this thy brother. You see, there's a lesson there for us to learn. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. See that in the text five times. Five times he calls them brothers. Now, brotherhood should mean something. It means that we are children of the same father. And Malachi asked this question, rather poignant, but yet penetrating. Have we not all one father? And has not one God created us all? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? And I would simply add, why indeed? So in our text, we have a command a needed command that is both clear and convincing, receive one another. Secondly, we have an example. Not just any example. We have a divine example. Just as Christ also received us. So we are not left to wonder how we are to receive one another. It's really not complicated at all. If we can establish how Christ received us, then we can know how to receive one another. Paul does not just say, receive one another to the glory of God. Notice he does not say that. There's some divine commas in this verse. He does not just say, receive one another to the glory of God, because if Paul left it at that, we would not know how we are to receive one another, and we might become one of those open and affirming bunch. We might come up with some plan or procedure that would horrify God, not glorify God. But God has not left the children of light in the dark. Through the Apostle Paul, he says, receive one another, comma, just as Christ also received us. So we have a question set before us. How did Christ receive us? That he received us is not to be questioned at all. Amen. This man receives sinners and eats with them the Pharisees muttered this truth in Luke 15, although they did not mean it as a compliment, it was truth nonetheless. Do you remember the words of that grand old hymn, Sinners Jesus Will Receive? Sound this word of grace to all, who the heavenly pathway leave, all who linger, all who fall. Come and he will give you rest. Trust him, for his word is plain. He will take the sinfulest. Christ receiveth sinful men. Amen. Now my heart condemns me not. Pure before the law I stand. He who cleansed me from all spot satisfied its last demand. Christ receiveth sinful men, even me with all my sin, purged from every spot and stain. Heaven with him I enter in. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receiveth sinful men. I don't know how it could be more clear or plain than the words in that grand hymn. 
And that song stirs my soul. Christ receives sinful men, even me with all my sin. Jesus responded to the muttering of the Pharisees by telling the story of the prodigal son. Now, we sometimes forget that, that the prodigal son story was told to a bunch of muttering Pharisees who didn't understand the grace of God. And so the Bible says he spoke this parable to them, that is, to the Pharisees. And then there follows the story of the prodigal son. And we know how the story ends. When the prodigal came to himself, he returned home. He said his rehearsed speech, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father received him with open arms, not as a servant, which the penitent prodigal wanted, but as a full-fledged son restored to grace. He threw a lavish party, killed the fatted calf. The older brother, however, could only throw a pathetic pity party. You never gave me a goat. Some of the stupidest words I ever read in the Bible. You never gave me a goat that I might make merry with my friends. Who wants a goat when you can have grace for pity's sakes? But the father said, it was right that we should be merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Brotherhood means something. Christ receives sinners. Pray tell, who else could he receive? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He came to call sinners to repentance, and when sinners respond to the call, he receives them unto himself. Yes. Hebrews 12, 6 says, He who was scourged for men scourges every son whom he receives. The emphasis here being on the fact that he receives us. He receives us. Charlotte Elliott had a hard time believing that. A lot of people do, that Christ can receive them, even with all their sins. Charlotte was an invalid, living alone in Brighton, England, plagued with doubts and fears, until one day in 1834, when she came to understand that Jesus shed his blood for her. And so she took her pen and wrote words that had probably been sung, perhaps more than any other song, at least at invitation time. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee? Oh, Lamb of God, I come. Amen. I come just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. Wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise I believe, O oh, Lamb of God, I come. I come. If I had not believed that Jesus would receive me, I never would have come to him. On June 22, 1958, repenting of my sins, making the good confession, being buried with him through baptism into death, rising to walk in newness of life. But because I did trust him to receive me, I surrendered my life to him. And here is where the doctrine of Calvinism is so wrong, so terribly, horribly wrong. John Calvin taught that the atonement was limited, that Christ's death on the cross was not for all, but only for those whom God had elected to be saved. But John the Baptist said, Jesus was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And John the Apostle said, Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Christ died once for all. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Calvinism libels the character of Christ. It alters Jesus' lament over Jerusalem from how often would I have gathered you together to I would not. Jesus said, I would have, but Calvinism would say I would not. And it changes the you would not to you could not. You see what it does? You see why it's so dangerous? 
I do not appreciate the perversion of this passage, for this is the very scripture that brought me to full surrender to Jesus Christ. Luke 13, 34. He who calls us to come will receive all who come to him. And I came to Christ in trust, believing in repentance, grieving in surrender, leaving in baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Christ has received us in spite of our past, in spite of our sins, in spite of our imperfect understanding of his word and will. He has received us in spite of how we were born, where we were born, our race, our sex, our economic status, our level of or lack of education, because the Bible says we are accepted in the beloved. He accepts us as brothers, for he himself is our elder brother. He does not remember our sins nor remind us of our past. He wants us to abide in him, to grow in him, to mature in him, to live for him, to die in him if necessary, to die for him and to be found in him. So the example is there for us to heed. Receive one another, how? Just as Christ also received us, which leads us thirdly and finally to the purpose, not just any purpose, no, no, no. The supreme purpose in life, to the glory of God. The supreme purpose of man is to glorify God. This involves any and every area of life. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Martin Luther said, a dairy maid can milk cows to the glory of God. Amy Carmichael said, our only aim, his glory. When the ark of God was brought into the tabernacle, David sang a song of thanksgiving. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. This song is repeated several times in the Psalms. God and God alone is to be glorified by his people. Most famous prayer ever prayed concludes with these words. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There is a powerful story in the Old Testament that illustrates the truth that the supreme purpose of man is to glorify God. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron offered strange fire before the Lord. For this act, fire went out from the Lord, and they died. Then Moses said to Aaron, listen carefully here, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. There it is. God said it. I must be glorified before all the people. There are always dire consequences in store for those who do not understand or follow this principle in life. King Herod was struck by an angel of the Lord. Why? Because he did not give glory to God. He had just delivered an oration that caused the people to shout, the voice of a God and not of a man, and he did not so much as correct them. His failure to give glory to God before the people resulted in his dreadful demise. Now, how does this fit in with our text? Anyhow, the people of God and the glory of God are inseparably intertwined. We are to receive one another to the glory of God. And the bridge between the two is the Son of God stretched out on the cross. Jesus understood that his purpose was to glorify God. For 12 hours from that cross, he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And he glorified God before the people when he died on the cross for the sins of the world. And he receives all those who come to the cross for forgiveness. And because he receives us, because he receives us, even us with all our sins, we are to receive all those 
whom he has received to the glory of God. The NIV says, in order to bring praise to God, and the New Living uh, Testament says, then God will be glorified. You see, not before and not until we receive one another just as Christ received us will God be glorified before the people. So our obedience to this needed command will bring glory to God. God is glorified when his children accept one another. Our failure to obey this command may not cause us to be devoured by fire or eaten by worms, but it will surely bring shame upon us. God wants his children to accept one another and to praise and glorify him with one mind and one mouth. In conclusion, the eternal purpose of God is to gather together all things in heaven and on earth under one head, namely Jesus Christ. This is what Paul said in Ephesians 1 and verse 10. Now, you and I are a part of this eternal purpose of God when we do what our text says. And